Today's scripture reading is from the first letter of John, chapter 4, verses 7 through 21. This can be found in the New Testament section of your Pew Bible on page 241, 241. Beloved, let us love one another because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifices atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the Father has sent his Son as the Savior of the world. God abides in those who confess that Jesus is the Son of God, and they abide in God. So we have known and believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and those who abide in love abide in God, and God abides in them. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness on the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not reached perfection in love. We love because he first loved us. Those who say, I love God, and hate a brother or a sister are liars. For those who cannot love a brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God, whom they have not seen. The commandment we have from him is this. Those who love God must love their brothers and sisters also. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us, thanks be to God. This coming week, May begins already. And on May 1st, it's the celebration in our household of the gotcha day for our dog, Luna. During the pandemic, we decided to pack into the car and go to the Michigan Animal Rescue League and to pay a visit to a dog that we had seen online whose smile captured us from the very beginning. We played with her for a little bit and realized that she was to become a part of the family. So the dog Luna came home with us and we were all joyous and exuberant. And she was a bundle of energy and also a bundle of unconditional love. When she first moved into the house, she was trying to take up as little space as possible. Sure, she liked to run and play and all of that, but when it came time for bed, she had her little bed pallet beside the, uh, the main bed, and she would curl up on that very tightly and wouldn't move until the morning when she heard movement in the house and realized it was okay to get up. Whenever we would sit on the couch or something like that, she would curl up in the corner and just be this tight little ball, but as she became more comfortable with being in the house... 
as she became more sure of herself and her presence in the house, she began to stretch out quite a bit more. You know how animals can be. You know, cats are a liquid. They will conform to any container that you give them. You just pour them into a, a, a container. And dogs are kind of like those uh, slinky dogs. <laughs> Whenever you pull on them, they stretch way out. And, and Luna was very much like that. She would get up on the couch. I would be sitting on there to call my mom and see how she was doing. And the cat would climb up on my lap and Luna would be laying to my left. And she would stretch the entire rest of the length of the couch. So as she became more and more confident of her place in the family, that stretch became longer and longer till there was just enough space for me on the end of the couch and there was just unconditional canine love. There was room for little anything else except for Luna and the person that she happened to be sitting next to at that particular time. That love continues to grow and she becomes more sure of herself and, and there are so many ways in which she expresses that love and part of that is taking up lots of space. This epistle that was read this morning is to a, a new church community that's trying to figure out what it is to be the church, to be followers of the way of Christ. And a lot of epistles that we find in the Bible begin with an introduction of who it's from and who it's to. This one, however, contains none of the above. It is attributed to John, but we don't know who wrote it. It's attributed to John, scholars think, because of the way it clarifies and speaks to some of the theology contained within the Gospel of John. And so they just stamped that name on there and said to whomever this community is, that's who was writing it. We don't know the nature of the place of the community, but we do surmise from some of the writings that there were some struggles in finding the ways of being community and being church together. The early church was very pluralistic in a lot of ways. There were men and there were women. There were people from various and other cities and countries. There were people who began their walk of faith in the Jewish faith. And there were some that had been a part of other religions from other places. And so there was this struggle to get this sense of just who is this God we're talking about? What is the nature of this God whom we gather to worship? So this first letter of John to this mysterious community is helping them to understand exactly who they're talking about, that God is this source of perfect love, that to be born of God is to be aligned with God's character, that everything God does emanates from God's loving nature. And we, as the church, as followers of the way of Christ, are to be conduits of God's love to the community. So that as people develop in their life of faith, God's love grows within them and there's little room for anything else but love. Like Luna stretching out on the couch, it crowds out anything other than love. The experience of perfect love of the invisible God is made known through the ways in which compassion is shown to one another. They have this sense, even though they can't see God, the experience of this perfect love informs them about the nature of God. And when we love in response to God's love, we are being perfected in love. That sounds strangely Wesleyan. John Wesley spoke of being made perfect in love, not that we 
suddenly become without flaw, but that our first response in the things we encounter in life is based out of God's love. In fact, in John Wesley's sermon, The Circumcision of the Heart, he says, love is the fulfilling of the law and the end of the commandment. Very excellent things are spoken of love. It is the essence, the spirit, the life of all virtue. It is not only the first and great command, but it's also all of the commandments in one. Whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are amiable or honorable, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, they are all comprised in this one word, love. So this early church, seeking to find their way together amidst their many differences, are reminded that everything about their life of faith is based in God's perfecting love, bringing us to the point where it is a reflex to respond out of compassion and love and sensitivity to one another to be the kind of people that are attuned to the needs and the cries of our community. So this morning, we are seeking as a congregation to find out what it is that our community is needing. We are hearing from the Justice League about ways in which we as a congregation have served in the past to meet the needs of our community and world. We're looking at the ways in which some of those ministries are shifting into new expressions of God's love because we see that our community is always changing, and as things change, those needs and those cries of those people in need have also changed. So we recognize that in the midst of all of these changes, the loving thing to do is to change along with it, to meet those needs where they are. We are seeking ways of being of good use and being great expressions of God's love to our neighbor. And it means constantly reevaluating what it is we do and how we do it so that we don't do something just because it's been done before but rather because it is really meeting the community where they are. The General Conference of the United Methodist Church is seeking to do similar things, gathering supposedly every four years to reevaluate and talk about our ministry and aim for the next four years of ministry, what, how that's going to be shaped We see in this general conference the movement of God's love in ways that take what had been and reshaping it for the days in which we find ourselves now, trying to do the loving thing. It's not perfect, but it's moving in that direction and relying upon God's spirit and God's presence and God's example, we hope to make it better each time we gather. One of my friends posted on Facebook this weekend about a poem that she really had a deep appreciation for that I'd like to share with you. It's called To Be of Use by Marge Piercy from the book Circles on the Water. The people I love the best jump into work head first without dallying in the shadows and swim off with sure strokes almost out of sight. They seem to become natives of that element, the black, sleek heads of seals bouncing like half-submerged balls. I love people who harness themselves an ox to a heavy cart who pull like water buffalo with massive patience, who strain in the mud and the muck to move things forward, who do what has to be done again and again. I want to be with people who submerge in the task, who go into the fields to harvest and work in a row and pass the bags along, who are not 
parlor generals and field deserters, but move in a common rhythm when the food must come in or the fire be put out. The work of the world is common as mud. Botched, it smears the hands, crumbles to dust. But the thing worth doing well done has a shape that satisfies, clean and evident. Greek amphoras for wine or oil, Hopi vases that held corn are put in museums, but you know they were made to be used. The pitcher cries for water to carry and a person for work that is real. As we move into these days ahead, may we look to that example of God's perfecting love and may we be of good use. Amen.